shutter speed, aperture, ISO. These are the three things that if you understand them, are gonna level up your photography game. Now, I know what you're thinking. This is a camera channel, why the hell am I looking at oranges? And the truth is, it's just a really boring subject. But if you put the time in to learn it, your photography is gonna improve loads. Let me explain why. So don't panic, there is a purpose of these oranges in the video. I'm not just pissing around with them for no good reason. I'm gonna use them throughout the video to try and show you which, what each of these settings does and how one has an impact on the other one rather than just me waffle on. If you're anything like me, I'm a practical person. I prefer to be shown it rather than read about it or just be told about it. So these are gonna come in handy in a little while when we get into it. But I thought I'd quickly explain the purpose behind this video and it's because we get so many questions or comments every week saying, oh, I've been out and bought a really expensive camera but it's just not taking great pictures or what camera would you suggest I buy to go and get good pictures? And the simple answer is, there isn't one. You have to, if you wanna progress, you do need to learn the, the basics of photography. Now, not every camera has these settings, but I thought I'd go through them anyway because many of you are on DSLRs. The new iPhones have them. Uh, in fact, a lot of new smartphones have them. So we'll just go over them and don't just think I'm talking about photography because the, the basic rules of this apply in filmmaking as well. And this is what gives you creative control. So without further ado, let's get into the boring stuff. So the first setting I wanna go over is shutter speed. But before we do that, you will need to put your camera into manual settings. So take it off the little A, find the little M and move it over. Now every camera is different. I can't tell you how it's gonna be done on your camera, but on my camera, I have a little wheel on the top and I just spin that round from A to M. You'll need to figure out on your own how you do it for your camera. But yeah, shutter speed. So shutter speed you would use to stop motion or use motion. So basically shutter speed is how quickly the shutter at the back of your camera stays open. So when you hear that noise, that's the shutter open. So it's opens and closed and it dictates how much light can get in for, depending on how long the shutter is open. So a slow shutter speed, so something like one over 50 would be open for longer, more light comes in then closes. Faster shutter speed, so one two thousandth of a second is like that, so the minimal light gets in. Now what that means is, is that you can either freeze motion or display motion if that makes sense. So for example, freezing motion might be taking a picture of a bird in flight or your dog running through the park or your kids playing in the garden. Displaying motion might be when you want to take a long exposure and what that means is the shutter stays open longer, hence long, long exposure. An example of that would be a waterfall where you want to retain some sort of effect of motion in the water coming down the waterfall. Um, but I'll do a quick couple of examples with this orange just to show you what I mean. Um, and hopefully you will then understand what shutter speed does and have a general idea of when you might want to use it. Uh, you'll have to excuse me, there's not a lot of space in my house to set up two cameras and find a relatively blank background. So this is the setup. Okay, so here on the back of my camera, you can see this one over 200, that's the shutter speed. So I know on this camera that my back wheel what was that? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set one at what I think is going to be too slow a shutter speed to capture motion but will capture motion blur. So I'm going to try something like one eighth of a second. I'm simply then going to throw this orange up in the air, take a picture and then I'll show you guys what that does. Don't worry about any of these other settings, we'll get into those in a minute. Just concentrate on shutter speed for now. So I will put this image up on the screen so you can look at it now but as you can see there's clearly lots of motion in the orange. You can see the orange moving through the sky and it's, you know, it's not a clear in focus shot, which if you want that, that's that water motion or anything where you need that, then great, that's what you use. But if you wanted to capture something fast moving like your dog in the park or your child, we'd need to up the shutter speed. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn the shutter speed right up to something like, uh, let's try one, two thousandths of a second for now. Again, ignore all the other settings, we're just looking at shutter speed for the moment. So we'll do the same thing with the orange. And as you can see, this time the orange is perfectly stopped in motion. So again, I'll put the image up on the screen so you can see the difference. So hopefully that's given you a rough understanding of what shutter speed does and when you might want to use it. Um, you'll notice with that I was using a single point focus point. Don't worry about that for now. We're just concentrating on these three settings and what they do. Focus modes are something that you will need to learn, but we'll do that at another time. And they are very different per camera, so, so yeah. Right then, let's move on.
So the next setting I want to go over is Aperture. Now bear with me because this is the worst one and it does get a bit complicated. And for me, it was definitely the biggest stepping stone I had to get over to understanding these settings. But basically Aperture is another way that you as the photographer can control the amount of light that's coming in through your lens and camera and hitting that sensor at the back. So Aperture is usually denoted by what's called an f-stop or an f-number. And if you've done any kind of research into photography before, you would have seen where other photographers put up their settings and you'll have the one over 200, which is your shutter speed and then it'll be followed by an F number. So it'll say F16, F8, F2.8. And that number denotes how big that the diaphragm in the back of your lens opens up, and that's how aperture is controlled. So basically in the back of your lens, there's a, a diaphragm. It starts off, it's set at closed, and then you set a number, and that dictates how wide that's gonna open up and how much light it's gonna let in. This is where it gets a bit tricky. The smaller the number, the wider that, that hole opens, basically. So, no puns, please. Uh, so basically, if you see a low number, perhaps f2.8, f1.8, f1.4, that means the diaphragm has opened fully, or as far as that camera may be able to go. And if you see a higher number, f16, f22, that means it's only opened a little bit. Now, what does this mean in real terms in photography? So basically, you'd have all seen those portraits where the subject's perfectly in fact, in fact, I'm using it now. So I've got my camera, my lens set to f2.8 deliberately so that I'm in focus and everything behind me, i.e. the mess that is in this house, is blurred out so you can't really see it because my wife, when she sees this, will kill me if I film in the house and it's full of mess. Uh, for those of you from the other channel, you will know that. But basically what this means, if you set a wide aperture or a, a big hole, basically that means the background will be blurred. So if you take those types of portraits where you just want the subject to be very much in focus and the background completely blurred out, you would use a wide aperture. Dog's awake. If you wanted to take a landscape shot where everything is in focus, so from the foreground all the way to the background is in focus, you would use a much smaller aperture, keeping that hole small. So I hope that makes sense. I know it does get a bit confusing, and there is a lot of terminology around aperture, so sometimes, especially in wildlife photography, you'll hear, oh, I need a fast lens. Now, a fast lens is something that will go to an extremely low aperture or an extremely wide aperture, so the hole will open up large. And I will get to why they call that a fast lens and why it's all relevant in a minute once we've gone through all the settings. So what I've done is over there, let me get out of the way. Look, we've got three, I've got my oranges. My oranges are all set up there in a line, and I'm gonna go over there now and show you how to change the aperture settings and what that would do for your images. I hope. Right, so I do hope you guys can see this okay. So here is where the aperture is. So as you can see at the minute, it's at f1.8. Again, you will need to figure out on your camera how to change it, but you can change it and it'll go up to f5, right up to whatever you, you want. Now I'm deliberately using a 135 millimeter lens with a very wide aperture so that I can really demonstrate to you guys exactly what this does. So, as you can see there, I've got my oranges set up in a row, so one's in front of the other, so I can demonstrate to you guys depth of field. Now, depth of field, like I said earlier, is what's in focus and what's out of focus. So at the minute, because I've got a wide aperture, so a low number, 1.8, I've got a very shallow depth of field, which means only my thing that I'm focusing on is gonna be in focus and everything else is gonna be blurred. Now, artistically, you can use this quite a lot. So at the minute, I'm using this to really highlight the orange that says aperture. If I change my focus but keep my shallow depth of field, so my low aperture, I could then make shutter speed my main point of focus in this image. Or I could even go and make ISO, the orange that says ISO, my main uh, focus point in this image. So I take a picture, I'll put it back on the aperture one. So again, this is at f1.8. We'll take a photo and I'll pop that up on the screen now so that you can see how having that wide aperture has created a nice amount of blur behind the subject to really bring into focus the aperture as being the main subject of this image. And again, you can use this in filmmaking to do exactly the same job. So on the other end of the spectrum, you can see I'm now gonna to start to bring my aperture up. Uh, so by doing this, I'm making that hole smaller. Uh, and if I switch back to the other view, so it was completely blurred out like that. And as I bring that aperture up, so I'm now going up F10, F11, F14. You can now see that everything in that image is in focus or almost. So I'll take a picture just so I can put the two up so you can see the difference. Now, one thing you will notice is the second image is much darker than the first image. And that is what we're gonna get into next as we start to look at ISO and how these three things affect each other. But hopefully 
that's given you an idea of how you can use Aperture artistically in your images uh, to create depth of field, hopefully. And the last setting that I want to go over is ISO or ISO. Um, if you're still with me at this point, well done. I know it's a lot of information to take in and it does take a long time to get your head around it. So don't panic if you don't understand it all at once. But ISO is the easiest of the three to understand. And basically ISO is what I call artificial light. So it's the capability of your sensor to react to light. That's how I see it in my head anyway. Now you can set your ISO nice and low at 100 or if you're in a dark situation, you can bump it right up to whatever your camera is capable of. 12,800, 64,000, they're all different. Now you might think that sounds amazing because it doesn't matter what the light, then you can just bump up the ISO and get fake light and it'll all be good. Now that would be great, but that isn't the case. The downside of bumping up your ISO is it introduces what is called grain or noise into your image. Uh, I'll pop on the screen now a couple of examples of noisy images because they're not necessarily pleasant. However, a noisy image is better than no image or a blurry image, so having the ISO there is a benefit. So now we understand what all three settings do, I'm just going to talk a little bit. Um, I'm going to show you how I set up ISO on my cameras to start with, because I don't have it on fully manual. I use it on a slightly auto setting, and then we'll go over how one affects the other and in what situations you might want to adjust one to compensate for another one. Right, so I'm going to use my ISO orange again to demonstrate this. And I'll just quickly show you how I've got it set up. So I go into my camera. Again, all cameras are different. I can't tell you all how to set it up on your camera. You're going to have to either YouTube that or resort to the manual to figure out how to set them up on your camera. Um, ISO sensitivity settings, I go in there. I then come down to maximum sensitivity. And for this example that I'm going to do now, I'm going to have it right up at 12,800. But in an ideal world, I'd be bringing it down to somewhere like 1,600. And then what happens is, no matter what you do with your shutter speed or your aperture, your ISO will not go over 1600. Then, if I can't get the results I want at 1600, I'll then go back in and adjust that maximum to a higher amount, or a lower amount if I'm getting plenty of light, which is better. So, but for this example, we're going 12,800. Um, and if I go back to this screen, you can see that I've got my shutter speed and my aperture set. And then if, say, I adjust my uh, shutter speed, say I need a faster uh, shutter speed, if I bring that right up, my ISO automatically starts to go up. If I bring that back down, the ISO will automatically go back down with it. And the same for the aperture. As I bring that up, the ISO goes up. Remember, because I'm making the hole smaller, the diaphragm in that lens is now getting smaller, less light's coming in. So the ISO is going to compensate for that by going up. The same with the shutter speed. If I push the shutter speed up, so I start going up, the ISO goes up. That's because the shutter is going to be open for a less amount of time, hence less light can get in, which means the ISO is going to try and compensate for that. I hope that makes sense. So I'll just take a couple of example shots now, the orange, just to show you, and then we'll have a bit of a chat about when to change one with another one, depending on what you're trying to photograph. Okay, so here's a shot with an ISO of 12,500, or over 12,000. As you can see, there's lots of grain, and if you need to crop in and start zooming in on that image, the grain just gets worse, and as you start to do edits, if you're going to edit your photos, it will pick up that grain again. Um, and then here's an image where the ISO is right down at 100, and hopefully you can see as I zoom in that it's just much better image quality. I don't know about you lot, but after all that I need a brew. Right, if you've made it to this point in the video, well done. I do understand that's a hell of a lot of information and don't panic if half of it went over your head or you lost interest halfway through because I know from experience that to try and learn all of that in one go, it's not impossible. It's gonna take some time for those settings to really sink in and start to make sense. Now, before we finish up, there's just one more thing I, I wanna show you quickly. And that is why these settings are so important. So on your camera, whether you're shooting on the live view mode, so with the screen, or whether you use the viewfinder, and do it like that. For photography, I generally tend to use the viewfinder. You will have what's called a light meter, or you probably, probably will have a light meter. Now that light meter tells you whether you're overexposed or underexposed. So there'll be like a zero in the middle, and you wanna try and keep as close to zero as possible. If you start to go too far above it, the information in the highlights will be gone, they will be overexposed and you will lose that and vice versa for the shadows, if you go too far under it, they will be too dark and that detail, you can get it back but it starts to really look horrible when you start to edit and bring up all that grain from trying to recover the shadows. So understanding how you change one, how changing one setting can have an impact on another setting to keep within those exposure boundaries is a huge, huge advantage when you're going out to take a particular shot. 
Couple that with understanding why you need a fast shutter speed or a wide aperture or why you don't want to let the ISO go too high or when to push it high if you need to. That gives you so much creative control over what you're doing with your camera and what you're shooting, whether it be photography or filmmaking, it applies to both. Now getting yourself familiar with this process is a two part thing. So first of all, you need to get your head around and understand the settings. And to do that, I recommend just not going out looking for great images, just setting yourself up something like free oranges or free toys or free, or you know, a couple of things and just playing with those settings and figuring out how one affects another one and what your camera can and can't do. And the second thing, and this is the worst part of photography, and I promise you, once you've got past this point, it gets so much easier, is to learn your camera inside out. So how to change between those three settings quickly. Now you're gonna to wanna to do that because the last thing you're gonna to wanna to do is either go out for you know a massive hike, get to an epic landscape, or find, I don't know, a, a wild fox, and you get there and you get the settings wrong, and you get back home and you get the images on your computer and every single one is either underexposed, over overexposed, out of focus, you've used the wrong aperture and you know, you've only got a little bit in focus. Believe me, you're gonna to wanna to learn those settings inside out and that is what takes the time and the hardest part and what I can't help you with. That is down to you to go out and learn on your camera and get used to. So if you can do that, I promise you, you will be a huge way further forward into upping your photography game. Now these settings aren't the be all and end all of photography. There are some other things that you need to learn, mostly I would say around focus, but if you can nail these three things, well done because it was definitely the hardest part for me it's the hardest part for most other people that i know that they've had to get used to so you put the time in you're going to get the results and on that note i'm going to end the video there because i've waffled on enough i'm knackered I've, <laughs> i'm drained from going through it all so yeah if you need to watch this video again to pick these things back up please do feel free oh there's some other great tutorials on youtube so do check them out any questions about anything we covered, drop them in the comments. Let me know what you thought with this tutorial because it was a lot of information that I've had to try and pack into as short a video as possible. And I've tried to do it, I haven't used all the correct technical terms, I've tried to keep it as simple and as basic as I possibly can in a way that I would have understood better when I was trying to learn it. So yeah, do let me know what you think in the comments. Let me know of any other tutorial type videos you want. I don't think there'll ever be another one this long and in depth. And I will see you on the next video. Oh, if you want to, give us a thumbs up. Bye guys. Thank you.